of Corrections, and Dave Wisniewski, the Capital Budget Coordinator, and I apologize if I massacre your names. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. I am Emily is with us as well. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll introduce her here. Uh, so, so I'm Paul Schnell, the Commissioner of the Department of Corrections. With me, as uh, you mentioned, is Dave Wisniewski, who's our Capital Resources Administrator and our uh, Director of Government Relations, Emily Lefholz. I want to thank you for having us here today and, and the opportunity to provide an overview of the governor's bonding recommendations for the DOC. Uh, members, in understanding the DOC's asset preservation and capital investment project needs, it's important to understand first, I think, our mission. Excuse me, Commissioner, I just wanted to yeah. say these are, these just came out today. So these are the new recommendations. Brand new. Because right? uh, when we today. talked before, it was last year's recommendation. Correct, yes. Right, and, and we have updated the numbers here as well, which we'll talk about. Uh, it is important to understand that the department's mission is to transform lives for a safer Minnesota. The work of the DOC not only makes our state safer, a place to live and work and raise a family, successful, successful rehabilitation results in reduced crime, fewer victims, less fear, and reduced cost. We often hear about the need to break the cycle in the criminal legal system, and the DOC and its dedicated staff endeavor to do that. The DOC not only uh, houses incarcerated individuals, we are also responsible for their health care, their treatment, programming needs, and transitional services upon reentry. And to accomplish our goal of keeping Minnesotans safe, we must successfully provide these services because 95% of those who are incarcerated will one day be back in our communities. We must ensure that they reenter successfully in order to ensure that there are no more victims. Importantly, uh, DOC facilities are the 24-7 work environment for uh, some 4,300 dedicated staff who serve the state each day, often in the most challenging of circumstances. Accomplishing our mission and supporting our staff is made more difficult when we have leaking roofs, pipes that are crumbling, and we have only space for a fraction of the programming uh, and services that need to be delivered. For your reference, uh, this slide uh, is a very quick overview of the 11 uh, prison facilities that the DOC operates, and uh, I encourage you uh, to tour these facilities and speak directly to the staff who work in them. I know many of you have, and I know that uh, Senator Jasinski and, and Senator Housley are, are both uh, represent areas where we have facilities. The physical spaces, services, and populations of these prisons vary dramatically across the state. Um, a couple of notes of reference. Uh, the facility in Shakopee is the state's only women's facility. Red Wing serves as the state's juvenile correctional facility focused heavily on treatment. St. Cloud facility serves as the central intake facility for men. Faribault is the state's largest facility with a population capacity of just over 2,000 people. And the Togo site uh, up near Canada is the state's smallest, uh, one of the two men's boot camps. Uh, the, Still, the prisons in Stillwater and St. Cloud are both well over 100 years old. Uh, our most maximum security facilities are those at Oak Park Heights, Stillwater, and Rush City. The numbers on this slide uh, provide a high-level overview of the department. Our biennial budget is approximately $1.2 billion. Uh, Commissioner, could I just interrupt you yes. for a minute? Um, so we have the capacity, but do we also have where we're at in terms of capacity? Yeah, we can give we can give you a sense. Uh, t today we sit at about seventy eight hundred uh, out of uh, if we add up the total capacity uh, is about ninety five hundred mm -hmm. uh, beds. So we're and we do project that we will hit the, that capacity mark um, by twenty twenty five. Thank you. Um, the DOC uh, is ninety six percent by ninety six percent funded by the state's general fund. Um, and the DOC is limited in its option to preserve facilities and improve them, uh, relying almost exclusively on, on the bonding bills. Uh, as you saw in the previous slide, we have an enormous footprint across the state 11 prisons, 7.5 million square feet of facility space, making bonding requests just to address deferred maintenance uh, critical. Here you see just a few important numbers uh, about the state's assets under the, the care of the DOC. To say that there uh, is a lot of upkeep needed is an understatement, particularly uh, when you consider the age of the buildings and the high degree of use they have day to day. The overall total um, of the DOC's bonding request is uh, $111.8 million. 
The content of the request is the same as what we proposed last year with the inclusion of inflationary costs, recognizing that our asset preservation needs grow as, continue, uh, as conditions further deteriorate. Asset preservation is the largest and most critical of the DOC's request and in the governor's recommendation and stands alone at $76 million. There are three requests that are related to expansion of needed programming space and facilities for treatment, education, and other services, which I will speak to them uh, briefly in a bit. Again, asset preservation is the state's, uh, the DOC's highest priority for the bonding bill. With the deteriorating condition of so many buildings within the, the Minnesota's prison system, the full $76 million is badly needed. The governor's recommendation puts this funding forward in a cash request. While the vast majority of the DOC's asset preservation funds can be funded by GEO bonds, there is a need for, uh, for cash uh, included uh, to ensure that projects are fully uh, completed. Preserving and updating infrastructure of our state's prisons requires a large amount of technology that is unique to the agency's security needs and those uh, elements are often not bond bondable because of their uh, useful lifespan. There are many reasons uh, why uh, asset preservation is the DOC's number one priority. Uh, we need the funding to address our heavy reliance on the state's general fund and capital investment process. There is a very, uh, the, the varying uh, advanced age of our, our uh, facilities and uh, the complexity uh, of, of them, and the fact that the state uh, prisons are heavily used and, and serve as living environments and work environments uh, for the people who uh, we serve as well as our staff. And importantly... Okay. Commissioner, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt no. you. You're talking kind of fast. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, just at a certain point when you have buildings that are over 100 years old, when do you just kind of call it quits and say this building just is not functional anymore? Madam Chair, uh, that is a, a great question. And one of the, one of the things that came out of uh, the 2020 OLA report on prison safety and security mm -hmm. was, uh, was that question being raised. Uh, at what point do we continue to make these investments? And in fact, the uh, OLA had recommended you know, to do a, a look into replacing the St. Cloud and uh, Stillwater facilities because of, of their age, the age of those facilities. And frankly, their design uh, reflects a very old kind of design from a, a prison safety standpoint with the tiers. Uh, today we use a direct observation uh, type of, uh, of system that reduces staff. So it is one of those, uh, one of the, the problems, the challenge is that we, we have to keep these facilities operational um, and, and up to speed for people to live in them. While at the same time, we, we do need to begin to make that turn, and we have done some work uh, in terms of just identifying what uh, the cost would be to replace them. We anticipate that the cost of replacing uh, a Stillwater today in, in today's dollars is approximately $1 billion, uh, and that would be the same roughly for St. Cloud if we were to replace those sites. But it is, it is absolutely a question that, that at some point we're going to have to turn our attention to continuing to stick money in, and, and yet we're going to have to, as we, as we have people living in them, but ask that bigger question of, of at what point have we just reached the end of their useful life, and we need to stop, and, but, but that's going to force us to really ask that question about adding new space. Or we reduce our enrollment by 1,000. Madam Chair, that is the other option. And I think we're going to see some policy things coming forward that we believe that, that are smart ways to do some of that um, and, and still maintaining the, the safety, the safety right. uh, expectations. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. you proceed. Um, as we, so, so as we look uh, then to our bonding priorities around programming and treatment, I'm going to touch on the three, these three priority areas. And, and I just want to give emphasis to the fact that, that, uh, that these are, programming and treatment are the things that we know and the research tells us will reduce uh, reoffending. In, in the next slide, and I think to give you a sense of the importance of treatment in programming space, I want to draw your attention to the shift that we've made more recently uh, over the last several years at the Department of Corrections to this person-centered focus. 
Simply put, that we want uh, uh, to, to match the evidence, uh, all the evidence-based programs and services that target the specific needs of individuals in our system, because the research tells us that's how we reduce recidivism. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. However, in order to use, ensure that we have uh, programming and treatment space uh, inside our prisons, we, we have to have the space for it. And right now, we are significantly lacking in that physical space. As the, the, the DOC is the third largest state agency, and our, and our work essentially boils down to the need to help uh, uh, develop a focused individualized plans on, on those who come into our system, focused on rehabilitation, providing that programs and services that are evidence-based while they're incarcerated, and then focusing on the continuation of those services as people leave and re-enter the community uh, to live pro-social lives. So in this slide, it, it does provide just a snapshot of our population. And as you can see, our population is staggeringly disproportionate uh, and an issue that we must uh, address and, and are devoting considerable attention to. And it speaks specifically to the importance of, of the programs and services that are evidence-based and culturally specific. I also want to draw your attention to the numbers on the right hand of that slide. Each of these data points reflects an important challenge in addressing risk and needs of the people we serve uh, if we uh, want to achieve uh, better outcomes for them as uh, they leave uh, our, our facilities. And, and I, I share this because I think it does lay as the backdrop for, uh, for the capital projects that I want to highlight uh, next. This next project is the Dakota Building Restoration. Uh, it's an addition at Faribault, and, and uh, Senator Jasinski will remember a, a fairly recent tour there where we had a chance to look at this. Um, a, a few, uh, you know, as, as we look at this, Faribault is the largest facility, as I mentioned earlier. This uh, Dakota building is a minimum security unit just outside the secure perimeter of the facility. Uh, the men who live in the building are receiving program programming toward the end of their uh, time in prison and, and beginning that process of transition. The services they, uh, they receive are critical uh, and important to get right uh, as uh, they begin that preparation to move. With this space uh, that's planned, it will support uh, the men uh, and their access to programming, such as adult basic education, post-secondary uh, education, including vocational and job preparation training, treatment services, uh, pre-release uh, classes um, as people leave the facilities and things like parenting, uh, living on supervision, health, budgeting, and employment. I was visited this facility just yesterday and uh, they're looking at a heavy equipment operator certificate program there that they have the space to be able to uh, deliver that and actually uh, dig holes and fill holes, uh, which uh, I, I understand is an important part of the training. <clears throat> the bonds in this request will fund the renovation of this building and the expansion of this space. As you can see from the photo, this is what happens uh, to the, <clears throat> these old buildings as that masonry <clears throat> begins to have water intrusion and the uh, masonry begins to fall apart. Uh, we have a temporary fix in place for this building, but it, uh, the deterioration uh, continues. In Shakopee, uh, again, the women's facility programming space is, is, is critical um, and, and short. Uh, this, is, uh, um, this, this program uh, space, this facility was built to accommodate about 400 max. Uh, at its peak, it runs at about 630 women, uh, filling every nook and cranny of that facility and, and double uh, bunking and using even what would have been formerly wings, uh, a little lounge areas uh, in these cottages where the women are housed. Um, we know that we, and we, we have community partners that come in. Uh, the legislature has approved a number of things like the Healthy Start Act, which is focusing on, on, on parenting and addressing the needs of, of, of women who are, are pregnant or have recently given birth. We want to make sure that those bonds remain and this programming space becomes critical to delivering that. Lionel Lakes um, is requesting an improvement, an investment to rehabilitate the currently vacant uh, E building, as it's uh, not illustriously called, uh, at the facility. Um, it's, a, it's a viable building for treatment use. Um, 
This is the state's central uh, treatment facility where the majority of substance use disorder treatment and sexual offender treatment takes place. I would just note that the Minnesota Department of Corrections is the single largest substance use treatment provider uh, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, next, I, I, Madam Chair and members, uh, there is uh, one thing I would just want you to take away from our time today. Again, 95% of the men and women in our prisons will return to neighborhoods across our state. Because of this, we have to ensure that those in our care, custody, and control have access to the services uh, needed because the safety of our state depends upon it. The bonding request, uh, I, I, and this is a, a lesson that I've learned just in the last four years, is a direct reflection of our agency's mission, purpose, and our stated goals. To be clear, correctional services have a direct impact on public safety of our state, including crime reduction, fewer victims, and safer communities. A 1% reduction in the state's three-year re-imprisonment rate would yield $5.4 million in costs avoided directly for the Department of Corrections and $57.7 million in additional costs avoided to the state, uh, businesses in our state, and society in general. And, and uh, we believe that, that these bonding investments speak directly to those savings that we're ultimately trying to achieve. Last, I would just uh, encourage you, uh, if you haven't, um, please, uh, we would love to have you and, and have you see what happens inside these correctional facilities firsthand. Um, there's nothing like seeing it, and each facility has a little different focus and a little different orientation, certainly different ages, and we would welcome and, and invite you at any time uh, to come visit and see it and talk to the people who are living in them and the people who work in them. And with that, Madam Chair, I would stand for any question you or the committee has, and uh, I appreciate this time. Thank you, Commissioner. I was just trying to remember. I've been to Shakopee, Fairbolt, Red Wing, and I believe we went to St. Cloud, right? And I've been to Stillwater, and I think I was at Oak Park Heights, too. Maybe not in recent years, but I've been around a long time. So I think I have not been to Rush City. I don't recall Lionel Lakes. Maybe not Lionel Lakes either. And we went to Willow River. We were there. Um, but I don't think I've been to Moose Lake or Togo. So I'm more than halfway there. There you go. We appreciate it. So the next tour, we're going to have to add those other facilities. Togo is a beautiful place, too. Uh, and, and there has been significant investment. This committee has, uh, has invested there in the past. That's being put to work now. Thanks so much, Commissioner. And I, I really do think that we need to explore whether we need to close one of those facilities and what, what would be an alternative plan then for those 1,000 people. Yeah, at least we, one, we especially agree. like the 1889 one. <laughs> Any questions from the committee? All right, thank you very much. We appreciate the update. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to welcome the Department of Public Safety with uh, Commissioner Jacobson. Commissioner, welcome, and if you want to introduce who's with you and then uh, proceed. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Senator Pappas. Uh, good afternoon to members of the committee. Um, on my left is uh, Superintendent Drew Evans from the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, and on my right um, is uh, Kevin Reed from Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Um, again, it's uh, great to be here today. As you know, I'm a brand new commissioner, so I'm into my Three and a half week uh, anniversary today. Um, it's been a been a great ride so far, and been staying really busy. So uh, a lot of the presentation that I'm going to talk about today, um, I have asked uh, Superintendent Evans and Director Reed to make sure and, and cover some of the details. Um, on the first slide, uh, here's just a, an overview of our capital budget request for 2023. Um, as you can see uh, in that overview. Uh, there are uh, three these uh, public safety projects that are, are really needed for us that we think are important to serving uh, us in the state. 
Um, that includes additional funding for the State Emergency Operations Center, and I'll just add that uh, without that funding, we cannot break ground on that facility. Uh, we also are asking uh, funding requests for more laboratory space uh, for the BCA, the Southern Minnesota Regional Lab. Uh, we would also like to finish out space that the current BCA headquarters has. Uh, there is some space available in the lower level that's actually just a dirt floor basement right now that we can finish out, again, to help improve our capacity. Um, and then uh, we also uh, are looking for some additional funding uh, that 143,000 uh, that again would be assisting us in uh, helping our local pro uh, partners uh, administering some grants for facilities such as fire stations and so forth. Um, with that, I'll pass it off uh, first uh, to HSEM uh, Director Kevin Reed and then to Superintendent Drew Evans to discuss their projects in more detail. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Commissioner. Welcome, Director Reed. Good afternoon, Chair, members. I thank you for the opportunity to talk about the additional funding that is needed to, for the construction of the State Emergency Operations Center and the offices for our division. But first, let me t briefly touch on the process. Since the original bonding of $29 million in 2020, the division has worked with the Department of Ad Administration design and, con and design and the construction companies to develop a critical, reliable, sustainable building that will serve the state, hopefully for the next 50 years. We completed the planning scope in 2021. We purchased approximately 20 acres in the city of Blaine. And the design process is ongoing with a focus on the division's mission of helping Minnesota prepare for, train for, respond to, and recover from the disasters. While working through this process design, from May 2021 to April of 2022, we saw a $10 million increase in construction costs. At that time, we went back to the design, looked at the reduction in the building square foot, which we reduced at about 6,000 square feet. We took a look at all, other, all the other factors, such as hardening, resilience factors, technology, and building systems in order to try to get back within the, the budget for the project. In December of 2022, after rescaling the project, the cost went up an additional $1.3 million, just in the construction cost. So for reference, if we went back to the original design in 2021, the building would be north of $50 million and we'd be doubling what we're asking for today. So today we're asking for the $11.4 million to continue the project. We will be unable to build a modern, reliable state emergency operations center facility that ensures our capability to support the local disasters and without this additional funding. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Superintendent Evans. Thank you, um, Director Reed. And, uh, you know, we were aware of this last year that you needed this extra money. And so now it was $10 million at that point, but now I see it's 11.4. Yes. Costs keep mounting. Any questions for Director Reed? I forgot to ask if there are any questions right away for the commissioner. All right. Okay, then moving on to Superintendent Evans. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Drew Evans. I'm the superintendent of the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Uh, it, these are requests, again, uh, that you, you brought up before that were proposed last year as part of the governor's um, capital budget recommendations, and we'll talk about them in a little bit of greater detail. The first one, and to orient the committee, if you're not familiar, the BCA is the state's criminal investigative agency composed of our investigations division, that is our sworn law enforcement, our laboratory that does uh, forensic analysis for the entire state, and then our Minnesota Justice Information Systems, uh, or services. We are located across the state of Minnesota in various field offices. We currently have 12 field offices, but we operate primarily out of two locations that are owned and operated by the state. The first being at our headquarters location on Maryland Avenue. And these slides, I should note, Madam Chair, are a little bit of out of order as we're going through them, but the same slides are in your deck if uh, that, that they're printed out from there. Our laboratory services um, are listed up here on the screen, and the investigative services that we provide are from there. Uh, also, in addition, we provide training for Minnesota law enforcement in a small division, but they train over 9,000 students every year through our training programs, and this facility would contemplate that. The need and the reason behind this is we have simply outgrown our space. In those two locations where we do laboratory analysis at our headquarters location in Bemidji, there is no additional space while the needs continue to increase. 
Evidence submissions, for example, in our DNA laboratory have increased 120% since 2009. Controlled substances have doubled in that time period. And digital media examination, which we did not do at all when our facilities were uh, created, has uh, gone up 122% over the last four years and continues to climb every single year as we see how electronics impact criminal investigations, and we do that in our laboratory setting. The need for this is to provide better service to our local partners, and that's why we've examined Southern Minnesota. We can best serve our law enforcement partners and communities across Minnesota by being closely located them, next to them. Right now, evidence often is mailed to us from across the state of Minnesota, creating that uh, gap at times that we would like to see. So this is a better uh, way to be able to intake evidence and then do the analysis in the communities that they're most directly serving. We would also provide investigative services in the southern half of the state, which we're already there, but we're out of space for our investigations division as well. It would also eliminate... Superintendent, is that location Mankato? Is that correct? Madam Chair, thank you. Mankato, Minnesota is what's been identified as the ideal location for that. We already have a strong footprint in that area. And right now with our facilities, we're over capacity statewide, as noted before, by over 100 positions for our current design capacity. As an example, our headquarters location was designed for 366 personnel. When we're fully staffed, we have approximately 500 staff assigned to that location. That's the location was uh, in southern Minnesota, as noted in Mankato, has been identified as the deal location for geographic reasons. It's centrally located in the southern half of the state, and we would also house a crime scene team out of that location. Right now, because of increased demands, we have two teams coming out of our headquarters location uh, at, out of St. Paul, but we would have better response time to communities that utilize those services by having those three teams, Mankato, St. Paul, and then Bemidji, uh, Minnesota. The reason that we're asking for a new building to be funded out of this and not lease space or look, we looked at that through the pre-design process and our laboratory requires really unique designs, specialized HVAC systems, specialized workplace, et cetera. That, that is the real need and the driving force behind this request is that that specialized uh, space that we would have. It'd be an approximately 40,000 square foot building. It would meet current demands that we see and then our projections as we project out uh, several years into the future. And as noted, there is no additional space here uh, or in uh, Bemidji, Minnesota as well. At our second uh, piece of this request is our Maryland building improvements. As the commissioner noted, there is a space that was originally designed to be a uh, gun range uh, for our agents uh, as they qualify uh, with their firearms, but we don't have a need for that. We have other partnerships uh, where we can uh, utilize range space, and this is approximately 7,600 uh, square feet that we would be able to build out. We moved to this location in 2003, and the headquarters is uh, completely full, as I noted. We're over 100 uh, people more than what that was originally designed to do at that. On-site uh, demands, uh, build out is ideal for us in this location to utilize that space that already has HVAC plumbed in and electrical. We just need to finish the space and, and is required to do that from here. In addition, it would create additional security enhancements uh, to that facility and provide protections uh, for either accidents and or nefarious actors that would wish to harm that location. We went through a um, audit uh, of the facility with our partners at Homeland Security Critical Infrastructure, and this would bring us up to current design standards, facilities such as ours that house some of the state's most critical data and most critical evidence that impact criminal investigations all across the state of Minnesota. So we would add a perimeter fence around there that would catch vehicles that might accidentally careen off a road as if you've been at our facility, it's a in the middle of an urban environment with a lot of traffic around us and very accessible. But this fence would also be allowed, it done in a way that would allow public access to our building, but we'd be able to secure it after hours and then when needed if there's any threats to our building. And that additional space would allow for approximately 44 additional workstations and office space within uh, the Maryland facility. This is just an example and an overview of what that would look like. It's uh, both cubicle and mixed space. And I would note that part of the reason for both of these is, is because of the work that the BCA does, as many have went to hybrid and different types of work environments, our staff have worked throughout the pandemic in that space 
in our spaces and need that because of the security concerns, the type of work that we do, the laboratory work, and that will not change. The staff is back um, in somewhat of a hybrid environment. They spend more time in the office than anywhere else, and so the space is needed, and we haven't been able to reduce our footprint. And with that, uh, Madam Chair, I would stand for any questions uh, for myself or the commissioner. Any questions for the superintendent? All right, I'll turn it back to the commissioner. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Chair Pappas, members of the committee. Just the, the last uh, item that we want to talk to you about uh, that I mentioned earlier on was um, the governor has a bonding request for the Department of Public Safety totaling $143,000 for us. Uh, that's to help administer eight local projects that have been uh, funded or asked for funding uh, for uh, $38.6 uh, million for those eight projects. Um, those projects include, as you note, uh, fire stations, training centers, and other public safety facilities. Uh, but again, that funding would help us administer and make sure that we're following through and, and achieving those, those projects. If the projects go down, of course, the cost of that would go down, but we're asking for 143000 for that. And with that, uh, again, we'll stand for any questions that any of the members may have. Um, Commissioner, wouldn't that, that wouldn't be funded in a bonding bill, though. Wouldn't that be funded in, or it could, it could be, I suppose. It, is, this, is that what the governor does? He has it funded in his bonding bill, or is it in, through the Department of Public Safety, which would be in the Judiciary Committee? Someone's coming up to help. <laughs> I need lots of help, Senator <laughs> Pappas. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, Chair Pappas. My name is Jordan Altofterheide. I'm the Director of Legislative Affairs for the Department of Public Safety. Uh, it is included in the bond. Would, you, would people with complicated last names say them slower? <laughs> I apologize, Chair. I'm trying to move fast. Uh, my name is Jordan Altofterheide. Altofterheide. Yes. All right. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, it is included in the bonding bill, uh, it would, but it would be done as uh, cash instead of uh, bonding funding or general obligation bonds, and it would that $143,000 is spread out over four years. Okay, but my question was, is this part of the regular Department of Public Safety's budget request that would go to Judiciary Committee, or is it specifically tied to the bonding projects? Mis uh, Mr. Paul yes. Tofford height. Very good, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, it is part of the bonding bill, so it would not be part of our normal budget. We only need it if these other grants that are okay. in the governor's are for, Right, uh, and it's cash. Yes. Right, okay, thank you. Um, any questions for the Department of Public Safety? All right, thank you very much, good to see you. Thank you. Hang in there, you'll be an expert before long. I, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> Department of Human Services. And we're welcoming up Dave Greenman, the Chief Financial Officer, and others. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Dave Greenman. I'm the Chief Financial Officer of the Department of Human Services. And I have with me on my um, left, Tiki Brown, our Assistant Commissioner um, for Children, Child, Children and Family Services. And um, I'm trying to get this plugged in here. Um, sorry. And on my left, uh, Marshall Smith, our, um, our CEO for Direct Care and Treatment. Sorry. Take your time. Well. All right. I probably should have practiced this first. Ah, okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you for your patience. Um, We're up, and then just remember to talk in directly into the mic. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. Um, the Department of Human Services serves about 12,000 people uh, with each year through its specialized behavioral health system uh, known as direct care and treatment. DCT provides an array of residential and inpatient treatment programs uh, for people with mental, mental illness, developmental disabilities, substance use disorder, and uh, co-occurring conditions. Um, DCT operates about 200 facilities over about 3 million square feet throughout the state. 
um, from group homes to psychiatric hospitals and large inpatient facilities. Um, we serve about, we, we, we provide 24 7 care to people, um, and when we need to provide a safe therapeutic environment for um, the treatment environment for our patients or for our clients. DCT facilities are highly regulated and must be kept in sound repair in order to comply with state and federal regulations uh, and for, for inpatient care. Um, many of our facilities are aging and are urgently in need of, of repair and renovations. One additional thing to note about our DCT facilities is that we we uh, provide care for Minnesotans uh, that the provides provider private sector is uh, is not able to, to care for. Um, what you'll see um, is many of our proposals relate to DCT, relate to um, keeping our facilities in repair um, so that we're able to treat our clients and meet state and federal requirements, um, and also provide the, right, the array of services that our clients need. In addition to DCT, DHS also manages a number of pro bonding projects to construct and rehab facilities uh, for human service for the delivery of human services programs by other government agencies and by the uh, nonprofit sector. This includes a program to develop child care services throughout the state, particularly in greater Minnesota. So what we're going to do is walk through the proposals in priority order. All of our proposals relate to direct care and treatment work and, and, uh, and projects um, uh, administered through the Children and Family Services. So what you're seeing now is the list of projects that are included in the governor's budget package. Um, there are a total of seven relate to direct care and treatment and two relate to our, our Children and Family Services administration. This next slide gives you a sense of the, the condition of the buildings that we own and operate uh, related to direct care and treatment. Um, and it shows our deferred maintenance um, chart. What you're, essentially what you're looking at um, is approximately half of the square footage um, for, D, for the DCT facilities are in either uh, fair, poor, or crisis condition. And that amounts to about $120 million in deferred maintenance. So next, I think we'll start, um, turn it over to CEO Marshall Smith to start talking about our projects in priority order. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Yeah, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, my name is Marshall Smith. I'm the Health System CEO for Direct Care and Treatment. Please know that these projects were, um, are, are really a repeat from next, last year, and so I'll cover them as quickly as I can. Uh, we have updated all of the numbers to be accurate and current. In our first priority, the Sunrise and Tomlinson Building Renovation, the funding proposed for $21.5 million will provide for a phase two of a multi-phased project model, construct, furnish, and equip the existing buildings on the lower campus at the St. Peter um, facility to make them usable for program operations for the Minnesota Sex Offender Program. Phase two will create additional space in community preparation services, or also known as CPS, and make it possible for MSOP to comply with the court orders to treat, treat clients in a less restrictive environment. The project will remodel more than 63,000 existing square feet, and this includes the west and north wings of the Sunrise Building and renovation of Tomlinson. In the Sunrise Building, the west wing will be used for an additional 30-bed occupancy for community preparation services. And the north wing will be updated in, for the continued use of clinical and medical and support functions. Tomlinson Building will be used for program activities such as recreation, chapel, library, etc., for MSOP clients and for facility staff. A significant portion, 5,457 square feet, of the remodel requires repurposing a pool area that has been closed for several years. That will allow for usable space for client programs, activities, and staff support functions. Renovation work will include replacement of and upgrades to exterior doors, windows, HVAC, plumbing, electrical security, and life safety systems, and exterior interior renovations. The rationale for this project is MSOP clients who are in the later stages of treatment may petition the courts to transfer to the community preparation services. And the courts are granting transfer orders for clients to move to CPS at an increasing rate. 
MSOP needs to increase the specific space in CPS <clears throat> and programming space to comply with the court orders. MSOP currently has a continued wait list of 18 clients with court orders to transfer to CPS. As a result of noncompliance, we also have two litigations uh, currently taking place because we are not able to get these individuals transferred out. I would like to note that currently CPS is at full capacity and our request will allow us to build out this space and avoid being in contempt of the court for not being able to transfer patients. This is the ninth year that DCT has requested this funding and without funding we will remain non-compliant in meeting the court orders to transfer patients which will result in greater litigation. We have had previous appropriations. In 2014, DCT received $7.4 million to design, construct, renovate, furnish, and equip the first phase of a three-phase project to develop additional residential program activity and ancillary facilities for MSOP on the lower campus of the St. Peter Treatment Center. This appropriation also includes funding to design the second phase of the project. In 2020, we received $1.79 million, which, was, which provided us the ability to design the second project phase and use any remaining money for this appropriation after design was substantially completed for asset preservation. This did not fully fund the entire project. Green Acres, the building that we use this money for, one of three buildings is fa in phase two, was remodeled 7,735 square feet, utilizing the appropriation and asset preservation provided. This portion allowed us to add 20 additional CPS beds um, to our current service area. Currently, the project will also address 13.5 million in deferred maintenance, and the budget impact is we will need additional funding for FTEs and other operating expenses um, that we will request once the project is completed. Priority two, I'll turn this over to Nikki. Um, Mr. Smith, before you go on to priority one, um, could you tell us just a little bit about the court order? I mean, is the court order nine years old, so every year the court says do this and we don't? Well, part, part of our CBS process is that the court allows, grants the patient, gives them permission to move into a less uh, restrictive treatment environment. And we've been able to um, meet those needs over many years. But now the courts are increasing that um, request, and we don't have the current space to make that mm -hmm. happen. And is it true that they're going to jail the commissioner if we don't comply? Well, is that why he's not here? He's in hiding. <laughs> many <laughs> times we're in contempt of court. Um, we get that threat of, of being you know, put in jail. But we have a good legal team that is mitigated. <laughs> Is it all of you that are going to be jailed? Well, sometimes it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, just to kind of follow up on that, I'm, I think you told us um, how many clients the court has referred for CPS that you don't have room for. But I missed that number. So what are we talking about right now? How many um, clients do you not have room for that have been court ordered for <coughs> um, Going, um, moving, stepping up to CPS. Mr. Smith. Yes, um, Madam Chair, Representative, we currently have 18 people on our list that are waiting to be transferred out. Thank you. And then, Madam Chair. Senator Nelson. And so, what currently is happening with those 18 people that are ready uh, for transfer? Mr. Smith. Yes, Chair, Representative, currently that, um, that, um, patient or client resides in our secured facility or in our um, transition area of the secured facility before we can move them out. So they stay in the secured facility. Madam Chair. Senator Nelson. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. So just to follow, I remember from uh, my previous terms on a capital investment touring uh, the facility, and m my question is, are there not ways that, that you could start to comply now with uh, for those 18 residents. In other words, I don't know what that is, granting more privileges or less uh, supervision. I'm just not clear what is the difference between relaxing the rules in the place where the 18 are living now 
to what it would look like with the new facility. Mr. Smith. Yes, Madam Chair, Representative, I would like to give you a specific answer to your question and would like to take this offline and get back with you. Okay, thank you so much. So part of that 22 million is for deferred maintenance and part of it is for expansion? That's correct. Um, could we just get a breakdown on that? Or is it in the governor's materials? Ma Madam Chair, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Greenman. I, I believe that the the work that will be done on the two buildings will address 11.5 million that's currently on our deferred maintenance list. So the work will, the work of rebottling the facilities to prepare them space for the program will address the, uh, the deferred maintenance. So yes, that, that one and the same, yeah. And we, but we will get a breakdown for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, continue. All right, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is- Oh. We're taking yes. to a new person, Ms. Brown. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Tiki Brown. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Children and Family Services. For uh, the early childhood facilities request, this proposal provides $12.4 million in grants to state agencies and political subdivisions to construct or renovate for early childhood programs. It creates classroom space with restroom access, cubby storage, parent rooms, prep spaces, et cetera. Half of the funding would come from general obligation funds and half from the state general fund. We have done statewide surveys of school superintendents and principals pre-pandemic and identified hundreds of millions of dollars in early childhood facility project needs. A recent Head Start survey found a need for approximately 50 million in funding for facilities. These new constructed or renovated facilities promote developmental outcomes for children who are at highest risk of being unprepared for kindergarten. The last appropriation that was received was in 2014. Funding has been sporadic over the years and uh, consistent funding would help stabilize the program and better serve the needs of young children across the state. You can see from the, uh, the slide and um, on the screen above the distribution of, um, of uh, facilities across the state 76 projects with 23 million of state grants were uh, funded. Uh, Senator Nelson. Uh, could, could I offer some questions on this Absolutely. project? Uh, th thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner, I'm so very supportive of high quality early education. And I just have a couple brief questions for you. One, um, the childhood uh, facilities, it says childhood, do you mean, is it child care facilities? Kind of fill, it, fill that in for me. Is it child care? Is it uh, preschool? Is it uh, pre-K in the public schools? Who's eligible for these grants? And then the second piece is, are the um, eligibility, are the, are the, um, are the uh, is there a requirement that this, these areas who would receive grants are following high quality early learning so students are uh, better prepared for kindergarten. When they Assistant do. Commissioner Brown. Those are great questions. And when we say um, early childhood facilities, we do mean the, the full span. Um, and so I would have to look exactly at the, at the definition to um, be clearer on that and so we can get back to you on that. And um, in regards to uh, is the requirements regarding the um, high quality nature of the care provided. I don't believe that that is uh, connected. Oh, that's mm -hmm. just saying it, that's a concern Thank that we would not be ensuring that these are facilities that are uh, practicing high quality early learning to help better prepare kids to be successful um, in kindergarten. That's my opinion. Right. So, Senator Nelson, I'm just wondering, you know, when we develop that high-quality standard, and it sounds like this hasn't been funded since 2014, so maybe it was pre. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Uh, but there is a proposal in the governor's budget for this. Correct. Right. Okay. Thank you. No more questions, then we'll continue with uh, Priority 3. All right. Priority 3, the MRTC building Back to Mr. Upgrade. Smith. The request for $16.37 million is to design and remodel the north and south wings of the Miller Building located on the AMRTC campus. This will be phase one of a two-phase project. The space will provide additional treatment space for patients who, who have both substance use disorders and co-occurring mental health conditions. 
DCT's Chemical Dependency Treatment Program currently operates in an aging facility with double occupancy, which undermines the effectiveness of treatment. This setting can lead to increased patient aggression, agitation, and sometimes even violence towards staff and fellow patients. Project rationale, currently the north wing of the facility is vacant and the entire interior has been demolished and cleared for asbestos. Funding for this project will allow us to design the space for the chemical dependency residential treatment unit currently located in the south wing. When remodeling is complete, the chemical dependency residential treatment unit will move to the north wing. After the south wing is vacant, additional work to replace the HVAC system that was funded in 2018 will be completed. This project includes HVAC, plumbing, electrical security, life safety systems. It will replace the roof, windows, doors, can reconfigure and remodel space, design and abate the asbestos and other hazardous materials and address building code deficiency. <coughs> Excuse me, deficiencies. By moving these patients to a renovated north wing of the Miller Building, the program will be able to maintain operations and move to a more therapeutic environment once completed. The deferred maintenance, this is an old building that was constructed in 1951. The Milder, Miller Building is in very good structural condition. However, the deferred maintenance remains at 8.4 million. There have been previous appropriations. Most of that appropriation went to AMRTC um, the AMRTC facility. Um, in 2017, the legislature appropriated $2.25 million for safety and security upgrades at AMRTC, and in 2018, the legislature appropriated $6.75 million for roof and HVAC replacement at AMRTC. There will be an additional budget impact relating to the operating fund, which would be requested for staff and other support costs depending upon the type of programming that goes into this new space. Any questions on priority three? No questions, so continue. Priority four is our St. Peter water and sewer upgrades. We're requesting 12.47 million in being for the upgrades and replacement of the water, sanitary, and storm sewer infrastructure on the St. Peter campus. This will ensure that the state-owned facilities used for direct care and treatment services are functional, safe, and in good repair. Our rationale, the present drinking water, sanitary, storm, and sewer system on the lower campus was constructed back in the early 1950s and has far exceeded their useful life. In 2018, DCT contracted with an engineering firm to conduct a water and sewer analysis. This analysis found several deficiencies and recommended replacement of the water main, sanitary sewer, and storm sewer infrastructure located throughout the entire campus. Without improvement, the probability of system failure is high. Please know that this replacement is imperative and critical to the infrastructure of the campus to ensure that it can continue to operate 24-7, 365, and serve the needs of more than 1,100 people, consisting of our patients, clients, and our employees. Currently, there have been no other appropriations for this, and the deferred maintenance is estimated at 12.47 million. Priority five is our energy system upgrades. This request is for 11.1 million for the general fund to install renewable energy systems and energy upgrades for buildings on our campus in St. Peter, Moose Lake, and Anoka. This re request also aligns with the governor's strategic priorities for climate change. The rationale for this is that the installation of renewable energy systems and other energy upgrades will reduce the overall cost of the future operating budget for the campus and eliminate the peak demand premium charge incurred because of our 365 24-7 operations. Between the three campuses, there are 67 buildings and nearly 2 million square feet. In calendar year 2021, annual electricity costs for all three sites was 2.68 million. The project, if, not, if fully funded, will have an estimated payback period of less than 10 years through project energy savings. The cost reductions will be directly associated with renewable energy systems and energy efficient equipment and upgrades. Savings, when realized, will be used for ongoing facility needs. The project was submitted also to the American Rescue Plan funding. 
and there have been no previous appropriations. Priority six, I'm gonna turn it back to Nikki. Ms. Um, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. This is the emergency shelter facilities request. This proposal improves and expands emergency shelter options statewide by providing grants to state agencies, political subdivisions, tribal nations, and private nonprofit entities uh, to acquire, pre-design, construct, or renovate, furnish, and equip facilities for emergency homeless shelters for individuals and families. The full 86 million would come from the general fund to improve and expand emergency shelter options throughout the state. Funds are intended to support the construction of new emergency shelters, um, to improve the safety, sanitation of existing emergency, emergency shelters, and acquiring existing properties to renovate for the purpose of operating an emergency shelter. Homelessness among individuals and families increased by 9% in the seven county Twin Cities metro area and by 13% in greater Minnesota. Additionally, the number of people experiencing homelessness who do not access formal shelter services increased 62% from 2015 to 2018. These numbers are widely acknowledged to be a significant undercount of the population. The historic underinvestment in shelter, especially in greater Minnesota, means that many of the areas of our, in our state, there are still no viable shelter options, particularly for situations requiring more than one or two nights uh, through a motel voucher. DHS did receive 15 million through the Minnesota Rescue Plan um, funds for setting and services that helped ex existing temporary congregate settings prevent the transmission of COVID-19. Um, and during that time frame, we received applications from 42 entities with requests totaling uh, over $68 million. Thank you. What was the average um, request amount? That is a great question. I might have to turn to a colleague for the, the average dollar amount. You have to call a friend? I do have to call a friend, if I may. Francie Mathis uh, from Department of Human Services. Yeah, thank you. Um, welcome. I'm sorry, would you say your name again? Francie Mathis. Mathis, thank you very much, Ms. Mathis. So um, have we had this program in the budget before at, a low, at probably a lower level? Uh, uh, no, we have not had it before. It's never been funded before. Okay. We did have um, a, 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 an amount of money um, during the ARPA time from ah. the governor, and that was uh, 14, 15 million. And so we did an RFP and those were the numbers that... And that's what Ms. Brown was talking mm -hmm. about. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, during that, those requests was only $14 million. So what was... You had how many grants did you give out, and what was the average amount? We ended up giving um, out about 10 grants mm -hmm. um, because it was a small amount, and the time frame was very short. Mm -hmm. It was like a little over a year, mm -hmm. and we're in the middle of that right now. Um, so we made it no construction, just renovation. Okay. So they were smaller between about, I think we had one for around 100 million up to 6 million in the current one that we have. Okay. Um, but the need is high. Right. And were they all over the state then? They were all over the state. It was um, about 60% greater Minnesota, 40% metro area. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Then move on to priority seven. Priority seven is our asset preservation for direct... Sorry, we're back to Mr. Smith. I'm sorry. Continue. Priority seven is for our asset preservation. This request of $8.8 .8 million is to ensure that the state-owned facilities used for direct care and treatment services are functional, safe, and in good repair. The request is for $2.1 million in general obligation bonds and $6.7 from the general fund. Funding will be used for urgently needed repairs at state-operated residential and treatment facilities to ensure that they are functional and in good working order. 
The proposed work includes everything from roofs, windows, doors, exterior walls to HVAC electrical, plumbing upgrades, even tuck points and paving. Project priorities are based on a need level of defic based on deficiency. Those three levels that we look at are critical projects that require immediate action, projects that will become critical in a short time if not corrected, and projects that require reasonable and prompt attention. Our rationale, asset preservation is essential to support the operations of the DCT residential treatment facilities and community-based programs. These projects cannot be addressed with the current level of, of funding to repair and replace a pro um, the, the necessary um, repairs. DCT owns and maintains 3 million square feet of physical plant for its operations, which includes facilities in St. Peter, Anoka, Moose Lake, Brainerd, Cambridge, and across 56 group homes throughout Minnesota. I'd like to note that the leased property we have is excluded from this calculation. The replacement value for assets is currently at $913,323,330. In DCT's 10-year plan, $20 million per biennium is estimated to address the most critical needs, those identified as poor or unacceptable, and allow work to be completed within current resources and staff capacity. Without the requested asset preservation funds, DCT must use a large percentage of limited repair replacement operating funds to address critical and expensive asset preservation projects. This limits DCT's ability to address routine preventative, predictive, and corrective facility maintenance. Ultimately, this compounds the existing deferred maintenance problem, resulting in a substantial increase in the long-range long deferred maintenance and renewal or replacement projects at DCT facilities. We've received several appropriations, 11 of them between 2002 and 2020. Three years we received two million, four years three million, two years four million. In 2018, we received 10 million. And in 2020, <clears throat> excuse me, we received eight million. We can break this out so you have them concurrently. Our deferred maintenance, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a deferred maintenance of $161,087,383. There will never be an absence of deferred maintenance balance in DCT. Priority eight <clears throat> is the demo demolition of Johnson Hall. This proposal is asking for 569,000 to remove Johnson Hall that is currently vacant in poor condition and presents a health risk and safety on our St. Peter campus. Our rationale, the building has been closed for nearly five years. It has a negative appraised value of 200,000 and by having this building demolished, it will negate more than 5.6 million in deferred maintenance costs. There have been no other pre, no previous appropriations and the deferred maintenance is currently estimated at 5.6 million. And then priority nine is our security system upgrades within DCT. We're requesting 6.49 million from the state's general fund to replace the security perimeter fence at the Minnesota Sex Offender Program in Moose Lake and replace thousands of outdated interior and exterior security cameras across all DCT facilities. Our rationale, cameras typically have a life expectancy of three to seven years, depending on their use interior or exterior. There's no current mechanism to upgrade these systems without dramatically impacting the facility's operating budgets. These systems are key to safe operations for patients, clients, and staff alike. It will also provide us a standardized approach to buying new equipment as we proceed, if funded. Our previous appropriations in 2017, we received 2.2 million for similar upgrades at AMRTC. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, that uh, concludes our presentation. Uh, you said that completes? Yes, yeah. yes ma'am, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you very much. The uh, questions from the committee? Then thank you, we appreciate the information and, and the upgrade. Right. So um, I just wanted to ask um, um, Ms. James, sorry I'm tired, <laughs> 
Um, so in the old days, you're fine. Thank you. You yep. can leave. <laughs> Um, I, I have to say, in the olden days, we used to get these great, great big books from MMB that had all the bonding projects and all the details in them. And then sometimes in more recent years, we've gotten printouts. So I'm assuming that that is all available now online. So maybe it would be helpful if, um, if uh, members were interested in the staff just giving us an idea of where we can find that online or if we wanted to even follow during committee. Ms. James and then Mr. Nauman. Madam Chair and members, um, those giant books are compiled every other year, so they were prepared last, last year. year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those and that information is still available online. If you go to the MMB website, I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through it. If you want to follow along, um, the MMB website, and then under the word budget, and then under capital budget, and then. Uh, previous capital budgets archive. So the so the 22 um, budget would be there, and then have has the 23 been drafted? Madam Chair and members, know that information will be collected from local governments and agencies this summer. And, oh, yeah. Spring so what and is summer. so then? Is there a link to the governor's budget because the governor is doing an update uh, and uh, kind of an updating his requests from last year, right? Madam Chair and members, yes, the governor's capital budget is posted online. So again, the MMB website, and then under budget, and then under capital budget, and then under current capital budget. Current. Great. All right, so at some point, we might say, everybody bring your computers, and we'll look at those numbers. All right, if there's no questions from the committee, then the committee stands adjourned.